<laughs> Abdullah ibn Umar radiyallahu an. So inshallah today, I want to begin in a way, hopefully inshallah, through which all of us can benefit. And I have some contentment that inshallah, hopefully, we're benefiting. Before that, the narration that I must mention of is of Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma. It's mentioned that he, Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu an, before saying farewell to the people, he would come to meet them and, you know, say farewell before parting his own way from them. He would often come to a group of people and would say that there's nothing for me to give to you, you know, monetary funds, or there's nothing that I can assist you with. However, I have heard from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that whenever a person entrusts someone into the protection of Allah, then Allah will protect him. So as we say farewell, as we part our ways, in other words, as we say goodbye, this dua that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa had taught me and the benefit of reciting this dua is when you say this dua to the person that who you're saying farewell to, that individual will go into the protection of Allah. And that dua is, أَسْتَوْذِعُ اللَّهَ دِينَكَ وَأَمَانَتْ وَأَمَانَتْ وَأَمَانَتَكَ وَخَوَاتِيمَ عَمَلِكَ That I entrust Allah with your religion. So all of the affairs, I am asking Allah that Allah take into His protection your religion for you. So I entrust Allah, you, your religion, your amana, and your final deeds. So when this dua would be said, Allah will take into protection your religion, which is Islam, your amana, the responsibilities that have been put over you, Allah will take all of those responsibilities into His own protection and your final deeds, your last deeds of your life. In a way, this can be used as a glad tiding that when we start to recite this dua at time of saying farewell or parting, then we hope from the mercy of Allah that inshallah this person's religion will remain safe. His, the people who are underneath his supervision or the people that he was responsible for they will remain safe, and not only that, this man will have a good end. This man will have the final deeds of his, the last moments of his life, inshallah, they'll be upon Iman. So now do you understand the importance of this dua? I brought a few of them with me, so inshallah, as I hand them out, if you happen to be a family and your children are here, just take one. So we don't run out, inshallah. Okay? So just bismillah, snatch one and pass it on to the people on the right and then you can go ahead and bismillah, pass it on to the people on the left and if I can have a kid uh, subhanallah who's a kid? no you're not a kid Hussein, come here come here, come here. quickly, quickly, quickly bismillah, go give it to the sisters give it to the sisters or you can take a picture of it just, just bismillah just take one, take one, just rip it. And once everyone, or once they run out, do let me know and then we'll go over it together, inshallah, with the meaning. You know, subhanAllah, as, as these are being passed around, I remember so clearly, you know, from my tender age, one of my teachers, he mentioned to me, he, he instructed me in memorizing and learning many of the du'as that I know today. And back then, I felt them to be burdensome. That Why do I have to memorize so many? And he would say, Uthman, one day you'll make dua for me. You know, one day you will thank me for what I'm doing to you today. And subhanAllah, now when I recall and think of the duas that he asked me to memorize back then, I haven't forgotten them. They've become my daily routine, alhamdulillah. So inshallah, one day you'll make dua for me. I think the brothers in the far left, have not received anything yet. Inshallah, inshallah. Inshallah, inshallah. All done? And another point to keep in mind, uh, be aware you will lose it most certainly. 
what I just gave to you, you'll definitely lose it within a day or two. So try to memorize it before you lose it. <laughs> it happens, doesn't it? SubhanAllah, it's the same thing with siwak. One day you think, okay, you know what, I'm gonna become punctual on this. The next day, you know, where did my siwak go? So something that, that is truly precious and that has benefit in regards to our faith. SubhanAllah, for some odd reason, whether it's because of our carelessness, but we tend to lose it really quickly. Or maybe, you know, shaitan has a better hand in it. So inshallah, just if you can look at your dua and just read along with me as we are all in need of learning. Astawdi'ullaha Astawdi'ullaha Deenaka Wa amanataka The sisters can also participate as well. Wa khawatima Amalik Once again Astawdi'ullaha Deenaka Wa amanataka the meaning of this dua is I entrust Allah your religion your amana meaning your responsibility and your final deeds so you know do your best utmost best as parents when you know subhanallah our children are going out Rather than saying, you know, subhanallah, or something else that, okay, I'll see you later, take care, goodbye, um, you know, be back in a jiffy, subhanallah. Uh, make it quick, or, or I'll see you in a bit, quickly, hasten, quick, come back. Subhan Rather than saying all of that, you have this beautiful dua before you. Before you part your child, yes? Okay. Astawdi'ullah, I entrust Allah, dinaka, your religion. وَأَمَانَتَكَ Your responsibilities, your amana وَخَوَاتِي مَا amalik And your final deeds And the merit and the benefit Once again Once you've recited this and read this to someone else That individual come into the protection of Allah An example from the hadith of Muhammad Wasallam. Before leaving the home Which dua do we recite? Or maybe do I need to hand that out next week? And this dua is so powerful that within the hadith of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam it's mentioned that when a person recites this before exiting, leaving his home, a call is made. There, you know, there, there's two interpretations to the narration of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. One, that the angels themselves say you're free, you're safe from the devil himself. Nothing can bring you harm. Or the shayateen themselves say, we can't do a thing about this guy. He's, he's escaped our grasp. He's escaped, you know, uh, our authority, subhanAllah. That the call is made, this man is protected. He's safeguarded. There's nothing, you can't harm him. The benefit of that dua is you leave your home. So subhanAllah, we're living in a time where we need all the protection we can. So duas are a simple way to gain what, free protection, inshallah. You don't have to pay membership. Okay, inshallah. One last time so that I'm content that hopefully inshallah everyone's on the same page. Astawdi'ullaha dinaka wa amanataka wa khawatima amalik. Alhamdulillah. So inshallah I'll uh, ask you again before the end of the halaqa without looking in. But that doesn't mean you just focus for the rest 20 minutes memorizing the dua. Just please focus, give me some attention too. Okay, alhamdulillah. So inshallah we begin with the story of Ibn Umar radiallahu an, And this is a powerful reminder for all of us. It's an advice given to Abdullah ibn Umar by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu mentions that once we went out into a, a, a garden with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam started to lift <laughs> some dates from the ground, you know, dirty dates from the ground, and he started to eat them. And he said to me, Oh Abdullah, would you not like to have some? Would you not like to eat? So Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, he mentioned that, Oh Prophet of Allah, I don't feel a need. I don't desire to eat such dates. I don't want to eat these dates. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he mentioned, Abdullah, today is the fourth day I haven't eaten anything. I have this desire of eating the dates. 
So I have the desire of eating, so therefore I will eat. Today is the fourth morning, consecutive, you know, in a row, that I haven't had anything to eat. So therefore I'll eat. So uh, Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala an, subhanallah, when he heard this, he was shocked. Not only that, then Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he mentioned that had I wanted, I could have made dua to my Allah to grant me the riches of the world or make my nation like the nation of Kisra and Qaysa. How they were blessed with the fortunes of the world. Had I wanted, I could have asked Allah and Allah would have given me much more. Only if I had wanted. But then he mentions, O oh Abdullah, what will be your state when a time comes that the people around you will save and accumulate wealth and sustenance for up to a year of, of length? Of up to a year of time span. They will accumulate, save and collect their wealth, their sustenance, their food for up to a year of time. What will be your state then? So Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala as he's listening to this Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa mentioned that when people will start to do that their faith in Allah, their trust in Allah will become weak. Now subhanallah, before I mention anything else of the narration one of the greatest downfalls of accumulating wealth of collecting and keeping and counting is that slowly but surely we will start to lose trust in Allah. If I have a large bill in my pocket and I know I have it I won't bother asking Allah, Ya Allah, give me a large bill. I won't ask Allah for wealth. I won't ask Allah for my needs to be fulfilled. By default, I will think and assume, why do I need to ask Allah? I have the money in my pocket. I want something, you know, son, daughter, let's go to the store. By default, you never think of asking Allah. But imagine when your pockets are empty, what happens? You have nothing in your pocket. The faith, the trust that you put in Allah is so strong. I want something, I don't have anything. I don't have anything in my pocket, but you know what, let me ask Allah. And Allah will surely grant it to me. So when people start to accumulate so much, and subhanAllah, we're living in that age of savings. What, what account do you have, checkings or savings? Oh that, and then do you also have a, a retirement savings or something of that sort? Or do you have a good plan for your retirement? You think the Sahaba had a 401k? They were worried that, subhanAllah, I need to think on the long term. You know, it's something that we can take home with our... When we start to put so much faith in our own abilities, in our own bank accounts, then the, one of the biggest downfall, we never ask Allah for help. Until finally when reality unfolds itself and we come to realize, I didn't really have anything to begin with. How many people do we see, seemingly they're blessed with, I don't know, hundreds and thousands of dollars, but yet, they're in a pinch around the clock. They fail to make ends meet one way or the other. They need to borrow from here and there just to get their system you know, in flow. Seemingly they have everything, but yet in reality, there's something missing. What is missing? It's that faith. It's that trust that we were supposed to have. Remember what Ali radiallahu ta'ala, he mentioned that you can never really taste the sweetness of Iman as long as your trust in Allah doesn't become more than what you have in your own pockets. You know, you want food today, we never think, okay, let's make dua to Allah for, you know, food. Just let's go to the store. We're out of milk, bismillah, let's go. So, subhanallah. So making dua to Allah for, you know, afiyah and sustenance and barakah should be within our daily routine. Not that, mashallah, today's payday, I feel to be, you know, the richest of all and I can do and gain and achieve, buy anything I want because today's payday. Subhanallah. So as a reminder, and then Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu an, he mentions that as Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned this, that people will accumulate and save up to a year of time, and then their, you know, yaqeen, their faith and trust in Allah will become weak. Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu mentions, then this verse was revealed from the Quran, وَكَأَيِّ مِنْ دَابَّةٍ لَا تَحْمِلُ رِزْقَهَا أَلَّهُ يَرْزُقُهَا وَإِيَّاكُمْ وَهُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ how many animals are there that do not have the ability to carry their own rizq, sustenance? They don't have that within themselves to, you know, work and, and eat, for, eat so that they can live, you know, as, as, as others. They don't have that within themselves. It is Allah who provides for them their rizq and it is Allah who will provide you for your rizq. This ayah as it was revealed at that occasion. So then Muhammad he mentioned, that I did not 
come to the world to accumulate its riches. I, I wasn't sent to gather and, and, and collect, and neither would I advise. And he, and he mentioned, and as a message to those who would you know, collect and uh, uh, go into that accumulation stage of wealth, so that they feel that this will help me in my old age, or this will help me in the re remainder of my life, then let them know that the one who has control of your life is Allah. That your life is in the hand of Allah. For who knows how long you live for? For who knows for how long you live for? We work as if we're going to live for another hundred years. Had we known how long we would live for, we wouldn't even bother working. There is a great lesson to be learned from one of the great uh, fuqaha of his, faqih of his own time. He asked his wife, how much wealth should I leave behind as I am leaving you know, for the path of Allah? The wife said, however much wealth you think I would need for the rest of my life, for however many days I have left in my life. He mentioned, I don't know how long you're going to live for, how many days you have. She said, then let the one who knows how long I have to live for worry about my risk. Allah, let him you know, be concerned about how long I will live for and when the food needs to come and when sustenance needs to arrive. You don't worry about it. So subhanAllah, as an eye-opener, we, we really need to start placing our trust where it belongs, with Allah. And inshallah, once you do so, subhanAllah, once you do it, your iman will become stronger day by day because now you're, for your, you're seeing for yourself. You're experiencing, you know, subhanAllah, things that are happening with you and around you and you, you, know, you, what, you just kind of say that this is only Allah could have allowed this to happen. SubhanAllah, this must have been from Allah. Or, no coincidence here, it was the dua that I made that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought into fruitation. So start making that as a habit, inshallah. Moving on with another story of Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anh, during his you know, uh, prime age, one can say. He once had purchased a few camels, and then as he purchased them, he allowed for them to graze openly in, uh, the, you know, in, in the land of the Muslims where all the Muslims could have brought their goats and camels and have them be uh, grazed. So, in, within the Bayt al-Mal land. So then, after some time, the very same camels that he purchased initially were you know, weak by, def by nature. They, they weren't so healthy. So once they started to graze from the lands of the Muslims, which were you know, more or less public welfare, uh, he brought the camels into the marketplace to sell. And when they came into the marketplace to be sold, they, were, they had a lot of meat on them. So Umar ta'ala an looked at the camels and said, whose camels are these? So it was said, it's Abdullah, your sons, Abdullah ibn Umar. So he mentioned, whoa, where is Abdullah? Where has he gone? Look at these camels. Where have they been grazing? So he quickly called his son. He said, son, are these your camels? He said, yes. He said, how come they seem to be so healthy? So he mentioned, because I bought them when they were weak, gave them some time and had them you know, graze within the lands of the Muslims, which is left for all the Muslims to benefit from, with the intention that once they gain some weight, I will sell them for a profit. So his father, Umar radiallahu he mentioned, no, you're not going to do that. And the reason being is I'm certain that the chances are, are much more that as your camels were grazing within the Muslim lands, people knew that these are the camels of the son of the Khalifa, which is, who am I? Of Umar. They must have given you, you know, more land and more water for your camels to drink and eat from. All because considering my position. So that's not fair. You are going to sell these camels and I will give to you your initial price that you purchased them for. The Prophet, you will give it back to Bayt al-Mal. You will put it into the funds of the Muslims. So he did that. SubhanAllah, as how of a, of a just ruler Umar radiallahu ta'ala an was, even when he had come to his son, and this was SubhanAllah his assumption, that most likely the people would have said, you know, Abdullah ibn Umar, his camels, yeah, you know what, let them graze from where, whichever part of the land they want to graze from, or you know what, let's feed this camel a bit more because the camel belongs to the son of Umar radiallahu an. Now subhanallah, in, in today's age, if a person holds high status, the whole family will hold a high status. Right? I don't want to take names, I, you know, subhanallah. 
it's all around us. One man is within a position of authority, the whole family is in a position of authority. Subhanallah. Whereas it's each man for himself. Moving along to the uh, simplicity of the lifestyle of Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhumah. This incident relates to his, the nikah of his daughter. Once Urwa ibn Zubair, a well-known Sahabi of Rasulullah sallallahu companion of Muhammad sallallahu he mentions that as we were performing tawaf around the Kaaba, I met Abdullah ibn Umar. And as we're performing tawaf, I said, you know, would it be possible, would you entertain the idea that I'm proposing for your daughter to be wed into my hand, I would like to marry your daughter? So Abdullah ibn Umar kept silent, did not respond, and kept performing the tawaf. So Urwa ibn Zubair mentions, well, his silence you know, mentioned no, pretty much. Had he wanted to, he would have said yes, why not, sure, I agree, let me go ask my daughter. But his silence, you know, it represents as if no, he's not interested. So he left it be. And he mentioned, I, you know, I became silent upon the, upon, you know, the silence of Abdullah ibn Umar, so I left it be. And I said, I'm never going to talk to him about this ever again. I'm not even going to bring it up again. He felt a bit shy. And then Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu an, as he came back to Medina, days passed, Urwa ibn Zubair radiallahu came back to Medina. He went into the Masjid of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says that I said salam the way it's, a, it's, it's deserving to say salam when you visit uh, you know, the, the blessed grave of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then after saying salam to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as I walked away, I, I met Abdullah ibn Umar. He was seated there. So I went and I greeted him as well. And then he said, Oh, uh, Urwa, you asked for my daughter's hand while we were performing tawaf. Was that right? He said, Yes. He said, Couldn't you find a, another, a better time? I was in the middle of my tawaf looking at the Kaaba and, and performing at tawaf, and you asked me for my daughter's hand. So, subhanAllah, the simplicity of Urwa ibn Zubayr and the Sahaba in general, you know what he says? He said, Well, that was predestined. It was predestined. Uh, that's what Allah wanted. That for me to ask you at that precise moment, what can I do? Qadr of Allah. He says, it's Qadr of Allah. So uh, Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu mentions, are you, are you still interested? So uh, Urwa ibn Zubayr mentioned, now that you've brought to my attention, yes, I'm much more interested in marrying your daughter than I was back when I asked you doing tawaf. And then he called, you know, Abdullah ibn Umar called his son and uh, spoke to the daughter or so and had the nikah done there and then. Subhanallah, this was... Not a year of planning that who we get married to, and then once you decide who you get married to, another year of planning where do we get married? Once you decide that, in another few months, let's choose the date now. I'm sure the people who are married know exactly what I'm talking about. It was just, you know, subhanAllah, within the moment, there wasn't a need for, you know, a well laid out plan. You know, subhanAllah, that so and so, this and this, in the precise moment and the time, and at that minute, subhanAllah. You know, so it was just, uh, you mentioned, sure, why not? And the marriage was done with such simplicity. And again, I implore all of you, including, you know, myself and my family, that subhanAllah, when it comes to marriage, let's try to do it as simple as we can, with the least expense, because you know the hadith of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? The al nikah, the best form of nikah, or the best of nikah is the one with, with the least amount of expense. The humility and how humble Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu an was. Once someone had come before him in his gathering and said that, Oh you, the one who is best amongst all people. So he addressed him just in this manner. Oh you, didn't take his name, referring to Abdullah ibn Umar, the one who is the best amongst all people. So right away, Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu an, he corrected him, he said, hold on. He said, neither am I the best from amongst the people, nor am I, because the, the person also mentioned, the son of the best amongst the people. So Abdullah ibn Umar mentioned, neither am I the best amongst the people, nor am I the son of the best amongst the people. Rather, I am a servant of Allah, and I hope from the, I have, have great hope in the mercy of Allah, and I fear from the punishment of Allah. And he mentions, I swear by Allah, you people, you praise someone so much, so much so, that the man himself, his faith becomes endangered. That, subhanAllah, the, 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 the whispers of the devil would get to him. That you're someone, you're something. We spoke about this in the last uh, halaqa. You know, the kibir. 
concern. So this was the response that he had given. There's so much to say and subhanAllah we're on 25 minutes past, so another two, three minutes or so. And then inshallah we'll conclude and the stories that I have, we'll mention them in the next halaqa inshallah. There's so much that, actually the du'as took some time today alhamdulillah. You know what, we'll just mention the last story of the night which relates to the previous incident. So he would say that you, you, you praise people to such an extent without a reason and then you put their faith in, in, in danger. Another story which relates to this, Tufail ibn Abi ibn Ka'b rahimahullah, he mentions that I used to be in the service of Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma and we would go to the marketplace together. As we would go, Abdullah ibn Umar never purchased anything, he never sold anything, he never went around asking for the price of anything, he would just go. So I asked him one day, that we go to the market, you don't buy anything, you don't you know, stand to talk to anyone, you don't ask for the price of each item that you pass by, but rather you just like to go to the marketplace. Why do we do that? Why do you go to the marketplace? So Abdullah ibn Umar, his response was that the reason being is just to go say salam to the people we see and meet. The people who we pass by, I go just to say salam to them. And that's it. So he would go to the marketplace simply not to buy or sell anything, but just say salam and move on to the next person, salamu alaikum. Move on to the next person, assalamu alaikum. And inna awla nasi bi hadith Muhammad sallam inna awla nasi billahi man bada'ahum bis salam that the most dear beloved or close to Allah or in his sight is the one amongst the people is the one who initiates salam when it comes to others al badi bis salam bari min al kibari aw kama qala sallallahu alayhi wasallam that one to initiate salam is free from kibar from pride from arrogance so this is the best way to if we have, and most certainly we have, no one should or can say that no, I'm free from pride. I have no kibar. We're not in a position to say that. For as long as we are alive, we are not in a position to say that. And then we certainly know we have kibar. So how to get rid of it? Start taking your dosage. What's the dose? Assalamu alaikum. Say salam to people. Whether you know them or you don't. Start saying salam to people. And subhanallah, it will start to develop love within our hearts, you know, by default itself. So inshallah, make a habit. I'm not saying go to Potomac Mills or the mall or you know, go and start saying salam. No, please, no, I'm not saying that. So the, the youth here would get, you know, the, the better hand. Dad's asking, where are you going? Oh, you know, we're in the halaqa, I'm going to the mall to say salam. Look, he agrees. We learned we need to go to the mall and spend time and say salam to people, their brothers and sisters we see there. And then from the mall, it's, subhanAllah, no, I need to go there too to say salam. It's just never ending, never ending circle. So start saying salam within your own space. When you come to the Masjid of Allah, say salam to people. It doesn't matter whether you know them or not. Bismillah, just say salam. And inshallah, it will do wonders. With that, inshallah, we'll uh, end it here. In the next session, we'll continue on with the story of Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma and hopefully conclude with the story as well. Rabbana taqabbal minna inna kanta samin alim wa ma tawfiq illa billa alayhi tawakkantu ilayhi yunayb subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika shudu illa ilahi illa anta sangfiraq wa atubi alayk.